Hey guys, great show so far. Really enjoying the conversation um, and uh, looking forward to the deep dive into green versus dem. Uh, and uh, I know that our next guest, Chris, uh, Chris Wiggins, uh, has an opinion about that. He's a loyal Democrat. And uh, I put together, he was at, he and I met at the March on DNC yes. LA rally. And uh, I put together a little piece introducing you guys to Chris, and then we'll bring him on. So uh, I'm thank gonna, you, Dave. I'm going to bring that up. As long as you join a revolutionary organization and you leave the Democrats, because the Democrats are the one percent. They're the ones who screwed Bernie. So on Sunday before the DNC in Philly, a hundred or so dedicated Bernie Sanders supporters converged on L.A. City Hall in solidarity with 68 other cities across the nation. Speakers included organizers and activists of various groups, all looking to either leave the Democratic Party or change it from within. One Democrat looking to see the party keep its progressive values is Chris Wiggins, California native, inspired by Bernie Sanders at 18 and now at 28 running for the U.S. House. Awesome. How are you guys? How are you folks doing? Thank you. Hang on, Chris. Two minutes on yeah, the doing. I'm doing well. How are you doing? Hang on one sec, Chris. Obviously. Okay. Uh, I feel cheated. I know a lot of you feel cheated, right? Yeah. Corruption happened, all right? As a Democrat, all right, I know a lot of us are saying, you know what, we're going to go ahead and we're not going to be Democrats anymore. We're going to move on from it, all right, because of what the DNC did. Let me tell you, being a Democrat is something inside of you. It's not just having a little D in parentheses when you're on C-SPAN, all right? It is the values that live inside of you, and I'm going to continue to fight for them, just like Senator Sanders is going to fight for it. I'm here to support, show my support for Bernie Sanders and let everyone know that the revolution will not die. When I win my election, we're going to go ahead and keep that revolution alive. I want to give it up to our good friends at Black Lives Matter. They've been out there for two weeks saying enough is enough protesting and I'm going to be out there with them as well. You see, when we talk about police brutality, right, it's, all, it's often just kind of misaligned and say, they say, well, no, it's, it, was a, it was a mistake. The police was protecting himself, all right, and then they don't realize that the victim was, victim wants to be protected too, all right? The police are here to protect and to protect and serve, all right? I'm in this revolution because of Bernie Sanders at 18 years old. This is my very first election, all right, and it's going to be my very first victory also. I'm running in the 37th district. My opponent is Karen Bass. Over about a year and a half ago, uh, she made some statements where she wanted to militarize the police force, all right? Black Lives Matter had already started up. There are countless, countless incidents, all right, of police using brutality, police having just military arms at their discretion, and she said that, you know what, we should go in and give them more of those. What, what we will be looking to do, all right, in order to get us off this long, distant tunnel of horror that we're facing right now, we're, we're going to craft immediate legislation. I will be talking with Black Lives Matter, all right, and I'm talking with police, the police commissioner's board, and I'll be talking with the police unions, all right, and we are going to partner, and we're going to get everyone sitting down, and we're going to make some things happen. She, she is right. I am a military brat, okay? I lived on two of the biggest naval bases in the world, Camp Pendleton and Norfolk Naval Station, all right? When I talk to my friends who have served, and I talk to the people I grew up with uh, from those bases, okay, they want our boys home, and they want that money reallocated to all the parties out here. We try to see veterans here all across City Hall, all down Spring Street, right? Patriots, all right? We're all patriots for them when they have that when they have that uniform on, right? As soon as that uniform's gone, what? We just toss them on the street. Patriots are the forever, all right? So let's keep advocating for them, all right? We need single-payer health care. We need to go ahead and get all these corporations that don't want to pay taxes. We need to get them to pay their fair share and come back here. We need to end fracking, and we need to end all the offshore drilling as well. You can check me out on www.chriswigginscongress.com. Okay, I'm going to un, uh, unmute myself here. Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, wait, let's do this. Oh, there yeah, it is. Uh <laughs> I was just gonna say, Chris, you're gonna need to unmute yourself. Yeah, Chris, well. you're yeah, your your turn to unmute. Everybody needs to unmute. Now okay, I th now I think we're all together. Chris, welcome. Okay, can you welcome. all hear me? We do. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Welcome to Pro you. welcome to Project Sanity. Thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. I apologize for being late. Oh, no worries, no worries. You're a busy guy, and uh, we like to see action in uh, in this revolution. So. Uh, it was great to meet you out at the march, and uh, I was inspired uh, by what you had to say, and uh, wanted to put together that little piece and get you on the air here. Thank you. I just want to introduce Thank you, you to uh, Richard Green. He's our host today. Uh, he's uh, he and I go way back, and 
uh, I would like, uh, why don't you uh, just uh, give us a little more information about yourself, a little background, and uh, then Richard and uh, Nis and the folks here in the room can uh, ask you some questions about your race. Okay, awesome. Yeah, well, for myself, I was actually born in the great city of Norfolk, Virginia, and lived on a naval base uh, at the tender age of seven. We moved out to San Diego, and I lived about one minute away from Camp Pendleton while my stepdad was stationed in the Navy. I went off to college at the University of North Texas, actually studied political science, and interned. Uh, spent my summers interning in Congressman Kenny Marchant, a Republican. Uh, Spent those two summers interning in his office and interning in the DA's office. I immediately, after hearing their views, decided I needed to hightail it back to Los Angeles. And I came here really for the sole purpose of getting involved in politics. I uh, began working on voter registration with the Los Angeles uh, County Democratic Party. Then um, at the age of 25, I got a chance to be a board member with the West LA Democratic Club. And I led up, the, I was actually chair member for their voter registration initiatives. Um, Really, after a few months, I just some of the things I was hearing about, um, just from their operational standpoint, I decided I wanted to leave and take a, took a little break. Then in 2015, I got to thinking about, hey, this political bug has hit me and I can't really give up. Had a lot of people that were telling me that, that they really need someone like me to assume leadership. So I just got to, got to thinking around and I was like, all right, I think it might be time to run. So. Um, right, you know, I've spent the last five years since I've been in Los Angeles. I've worked as a recruiter. Uh, I currently work for Hulu. Previously worked for the Walt Disney Company. Uh, so I know a little bit about getting people jobs, and I hope that can transition and carry over. Excellent. That's a, an interesting uh, story you've got there. And Thank you. I've some of the questions that we, I know that have been uh, plaguing some folks is one of the first ones that comes to mind is mm -hmm. okay, you're, run, you're up against an incumbent. Uh, that uh, you did manage to make it into the top two, so congratulations on that, Thank by you. the way. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Uh, but what? It, how? How do you see yourself overcoming the the just the gung the big task of trying to take on an incumbent in a race like this? Definitely. Yeah. I think that the biggest thing is really really taxing myself as much as possible in terms of the ground game that we use. Uh, that's Right now we're going to about three or four neighborhood council meetings per week. Uh, we're doing every weekend we're spending time doing some uh, neighborhood door-to-door -door blitzes. So a lot of money has been spent on materials to get, it, uh, to get the word out there. Uh, so the more people that I have involved in helping out, uh, the better the better I can do. The biggest thing when you look at an incumbent is she's going to have accomplishments, uh, right, which this, which uh, Congresswoman Bass definitely has, and she's also going to have a lot of money at her disposal. So the biggest thing for me is to be able to beat the money. Uh, you know, money kind of allows you to get reach a lot of a lot of people through advertising, billboards, and et cetera. Um, so the biggest thing is my advertisements and my billboards are all going to be people, and them putting up my signs and asking, hey, do you want the Wiggins for Congress yard sign? Hey, here's a flyer that he made. Aid, right? It's nice. It's not just made on the you know, the real cheap copy paper that you get. All right, it feels nice. They don't want to throw it away. Uh, they're sharing it to their friends. Uh, so doing that and getting out to the neighborhood council meeting, I'm using that to overcome the money side of things. Right? That's going to be a daunting task, but it's old school. We like it, and it worked for Joe Biden back when he was running for Senate. Uh, a little bit, you know, obviously, Delaware is probably smaller than this district is, but if he can do it, I can do it too. Uh, and when I look at accomplishments and what have you, uh, that's that's something where I'm really tr trying to find a way to sort of tailor the talks and say, okay, it's a, she has accomplished a lot, but let's take a look at some of the things that she said that she was going to do, some of the things that she says that she stands for versus what she's at, what she's actually doing, all right? If somebody's going out there saying that they're anti-fracking, uh, they're pro-environment, yet they're supporting, they're supporting a Democratic candidate who was pro-fracking up until it was politically advantageous, and that's a little bit of an issue. When they want to go and support a candidate who says that, okay, well, I'm going to go out there and uh, I'm I'm the person for every black person out there, but they, you know, they're married they're married to the person that went ahead and created the the 1994 crime bill, right? And then for, particularly the thing I look at is I'm not the type who's going to talk two sides out of my mouth. So I'm not in February 2015 going to say, all right, I want to militarize the police force. And then when I find that it's not popular, you know, I try to shy away, but I'm still having those conversations at different neighborhood council meetings. So that, uh, so really the biggest thing is uh, kind of getting, looking at her record, looking at what she says and looking at what she tries to enact. So, so it sounds like, uh, I, from what I've gathered that she, she at least, uh, come is seen as a reasonably progressive candidate, but what you found by looking closer at a record is that it seems as though that's more of how her rhetoric that she uses, but when it comes down to crunch time, 
and actually getting these things done, like you mentioned with the militarization of the police, that she takes a stance that does not necessarily line up with the, the groups that she's purporting to, to be supportive of and be advocating for, or on their behalf at least. Oh yeah, this is correct, yes. And so, you know, one of the biggest thing that I look at is uh, she's she and I seem to miss each other a lot when we go to some of the neighborhood council meetings. But on one end, when she's down in South Central, she's saying, all right, you know, uh, she avoids talk of the TPP and any type of trade deals saying, all right, hey, uh, you, you guys are going to be able to you guys are going to be able to do this. It's going to bring an extra revenue for you. Then when she goes to some of the more Jewish communities uh, within the neighborhood, then all of a sudden, hey, TPP is bad. I've been against it. Right. But at the same time, she voted for the she voted for the TAA. All right. And then uh, during the the whole TPP debate, she remind she remained quiet until it was actually time to vote. So uh, this is something that's completely tied to Hillary Clinton. She's completely tied to the DNC, and you know I do hear a lot of people saying, "Okay, this is uh, Congresswoman Bash. She's extremely progressive. She's extremely progressive." And then when I'm showing them article after article, all right, this is what occurred. And just don't take my don't take my word for it. Or right, you can get sound bites. You can hear when people uh, ask her questions. So that's uh, yeah, and I think that that's I. A theme that I think a lot of folks are finding out this election is that for too long we've basically taken either a D by the name or mm -hmm. you know whatever the signifier may be as that I can trust that they have X, Y, and Z positions and that they follow through with them when confronted with that situation. But uh, we've realized, especially it's been highlighted so much over the last uh, congressional sessions of how that doesn't actually line up. We saw uh, in the Carolinas with Democrats siding with the dredge mm -hmm. the bathroom bill. We've seen uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, Authority for fast-tracking the TPP. Several uh, Democrats signed on with that, and, yeah. and so on, and so on, and so forth. The examples are out there, and I think one of the burdens that we're really coming across as citizens is how how do we stay informed about all this? How can we possibly? How does somebody know what's going on in California's 37th district and know the difference between uh, uh, your opponent and yourself? Like, how how can we get this type of information and uh, I appreciate you doing a show like ours, which is one of those avenues, and and this, I view, is one of those important things. But what other steps are you taking to try and address that both locally and then uh, in, that you can possibly assist other Democrats that are in similar situations to you or people who want to run like you are mm -hmm. in the future? What kind of tips or information can you provide them about how, how you've been able to get that message out? Yeah, definitely the biggest thing. Uh, and if I can just go back to your question, just uh, you're asking how. All right, uh, so what are some of the ways that we can get a consistent message across and really kind of and uh, spread and really spread, uh, you know, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Right. Yeah, so, sort of spread the news in regards to our our campaigns versus our opponents' campaigns. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely the biggest thing. Yeah. Uh, so I say that the biggest thing is really like uh, like I've been doing with the neighborhood councils. Like I, I really gave them like fleeting thoughts like before I became a candidate. Just as they are, well, this is sort of like a uh, situation where you have you know 40 people or whatever, right? You go to these groups, they're about 1,500 people strong. Uh, you can look at some of the chartered Democratic clubs as well. Uh, I think that the biggest thing is getting getting meeting with them, discussing things with them, speaking to them, and allowing them to help carry the message is going to be huge. Uh, so. I, you know what I've done, like outside of using those avenues as well, is Facebook. Facebook has been great. Uh, Twitter has been great, just in terms of me saying, "All right, hey, come check out our campaign. We have a lot that we're talking about. Come here's a link. Here's a link. Uh, we actually have a blog on the campaign site. I say take a look at that as well. Um, I'm actually gonna, uh, or when I'm actually speaking at a college, or when I am speaking at one of those chartered Democratic clubs, all right, it's really kind of spreading those news, just saying, "Hey, come check it out. Uh, you know, I have a great, great uh, videographers, right? So." Uh, you know, if somebody's not able to make it, I'm really great about making sure that we can promote what happened in the conversation that we're having at those different events and getting them on social media. Yeah, it sounds like getting engaged is, is utterly critical. That You have to be out there. You have to be seeing people. And as you mentioned, without the money to do it through traditional media outlets, you just have to – You have people have to see your face. And, mm -hmm. they, and like going out to the event where Dave ran into you is a great example of how that happens, and yeah. uh, I'm glad that, that we were able to connect as a result of all that, and I, I hope that other people that are trying to run take an example from that and realize uh, even if you're on a different political, in a p different political space than those crowds that you're going to, you have to engage, you have to listen to them, and you, ha you have to be, let them speak their mind uh, as far as whatever critiques or criticisms they, that they may have, and that takes a lot of... Uh, it takes a lot of time and dedication and effort, and I think that's 
one of the things that even if I disagree with someone politically, that if I can see that they're honestly engaging with folks, and even if they're coming to different conclusions, that that's at least the kind of mentality that we need more so than uh, folks who hold I rig, uh, rig, or rigid rig, uh, mm -hmm. hold on to ideology in uh, at the expense of hearing what may be a differing but valuable opinion. Definitely. So uh, with that, I'm going to let uh, anybody else that wanted to get in here, I know Nis may have some questions, so sure. we'll go with Nis first, and, okay. uh, <laughs> and he'll probably be tough, and then I think Dave will probably hop in there uh, momentarily. So Nis, go okay. ahead. Uh, Chris, so mm -hmm. uh, you spoke uh, a bit about uh, fracking and the disproportionate uh, impact of it on inner city in, uh, in the Los Angeles area. Can, can you talk some more about that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, so like when you look at it, it's whenever when there's these are infrastructure issues, right? Well, part, you know, part of it is we got to stop fracking. We need legislation to stop fracking in general. But if you look at the situations where situation in Flint, right? Um, Flint's an over you know overwhelmingly black city. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that same situation were to occur here in California because we allow these this methane to really taint the water, right? And you know, it, typically you know in my household, right? It's you know. I didn't grow up with the most amount of money, so we were getting we were getting money from the tap, right? We couldn't necessarily afford to keep going and you know get the nice Dasanis and Aquafinas and all, uh, so we were getting water from the tap, right? Uh, like it's a it's a situation where the first place where the infrastructure is bad and where it's crumbling, um, that's going to hit the inner city. That's going to hit the inner city, right? When they're when they're doing fr when they're doing fracking, right? All that gas, methane, everything like that, uh, every type of additive particle, right? It goes directly it goes directly into the pipes that afflict the most uh, the most poor communities. So it's a like it's a situation where we need to look at stopping fracking. Uh, we need legislation immediately. We can't have. I mean, it's an environmental concern, just first and foremost, that we need to get rid of. Uh, and it's a selfish, you know, like the greed. The greed that kind of comes with uh, doing this fracking is an issue too, right? So that that's something that we don't need in society. So we need to get rid of that, right? And then the second part of that is all right. We get rid of fracking, right? There's areas where the water is impacted uh, within inner city, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to do with uh, doesn't necessarily have to do with fracking. It has to do with uh, situations where the pipes the pipes are crumbling, right? And they put like a lot of additives on it or what have you, right? And then mm -hmm. the bad bacteria within the water attaches to those additives, right? And then boom, you're getting you're getting more poisoned water. So that screams to me, all right. Well, once again, you're being cheap with the additives or so. But the very first thing is let's get let's get uh, infrastructure. Uh, let's get the infrastructure fixed, right? Let's allow clean drinking water, air, clean bathing water, to get into uh, every type of community, right? And then that that even ex that even expands further. Uh, you know, we have there's what the mute. I don't know why I'm pointing behind me because <laughs> it's not uh, not behind me. But you know, you go down to the. I take I take took a visit down to the municipal plant. Uh, I think it's down there, or you know, around uh, around around Carson or what have you. All right, we need to we need to make sure that we're giving them all the resources uh, possible. So now I see it as a situation where it's a it's an environmental concern and it's an infrastructure concern, and the re we need to really be spending as much revenue as we can to make sure that people are living. Uh, or, you know, are living the best, all right? I don't think that your your income or what you can afford uh, as far as housing should impact the type of uh, public options that you get to clean water. No, uh, it seems like water should be just a basic right uh, mm -hmm. of uh, of men. Yeah. Not that people shouldn't uh, pay uh, some uh, expense amount on it, uh, but it should be something that everyone of every income group can afford to readily uh, shower, shave, drink. Yeah. Like, I mean, that that just makes common sense. Yeah. Oh yeah. But uh, so you, you are running. Uh, uh, one of the questions we we tried to examine before was uh, the the uphill battle that you have uh, against an incumbent in your like. Uh, when you're describing uh, the, your opponent, I was thinking this is a mini Bernie versus Hillary. Like th th yes. this is uh, the, the black Bernie Sanders in LA going up against uh, another uh, white Hillary, <laughs> and, and <laughs> doing everything he can to uh, take on the establishment. Uh, but uh, what about uh, your age? Is your age? Uh, are you encountering ageism uh, when you're out there? When you're meeting the voters, or when you're talking to? Uh, people of uh, of influence uh, on election. Definitely. 
Definitely, yeah. Uh, I'm definitely, I definitely am experiencing ageism, and part of that is due to, I guess, my youthful look. I mean, I certainly don't feel that young, but my youthful look and, I guess, baby face or what have you is a bit of an issue. And then when they're actually able to say, hey, you know what, how old are you? Not, all right, what are your views? Or, you know, where can I check out the website? Just how old are you? Uh, then when they hear the, the confirmed age of 28, you immediately see their face change from the optimism of somebody going out there doing door-to-door -door to saying, oh, uh, this this young guy, all right, he needs to wait. It he needs to wait his turn, right? And the only reason he's able to do door to door is because he's youthful and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm definitely I'm definitely experiencing that, right? But on the flip side, uh, we you know we got some odd seventeen thousand votes, right? And I can imagine that you know at least ninety percent of them were well or well, well older than me, just based on the demographics within our district. Uh, I think that we need to look at a we need to look at a situation where. Uh, we can really examine kind of what age means, right? I hate to go to some R. Kelly, uh, age is just a number or anything, but, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, there, you know, Jay, this might set me up to, for Lloyd Benson to be able to go ahead and come back from the dead and say, hey, you know, you know, Jack Kennedy or so, but look, he, he got a, he got elected to the house at, I think he's about 29 years old and I'll be 29, uh, or just about five months shy of 29 if I were elected. All right. So, the biggest thing that I like to tell them is that leadership is leadership's not based on, hey, you know what, you're 35, you're 36, you're going to be a great leader. So, all right, uh, you know, you look at it, there's, you can be a second lieutenant in the Air Force or in the Marine Corps at 22 years old, or right? you can lead a battalion at 24. So if we can, if we can trust someone so young and who's well-trained and who's well-versed in everything to go out and protect us overseas, I don't see why I, at 28 I wouldn't be able to help advise a, advise a president because that's really what someone in Congress is going to do uh, and create laws. You know, the law, the things that uh, impact us the most right now are a lot of issues around uh, young people. If you look at the Democratic platform, when we're talking about we're talking about student loans, that's something that that's something that hits close to home. I mean, and when we do go to go back to the Black Lives Matter, right, right? When we talk about that, okay, I'm what I'm four years removed, basically. From, you know, not not even four years removed. There's still people within my demographic and age range which are the target for the police officers. So all of these issues really hit me close to home. So I feel like I'm the best representative to talk about it. Okay. Yeah, and uh, just uh, for our viewers to know, uh, before this interview, we looked at uh, some of the age groups uh, are in the House of Representatives, the U.S. House of Representatives, and uh, there's several times where the youngest member of the U.S. House of Representatives has been 24 when elected and 25 when uh, actually taking office. This has happened several times, so uh, having young uh, representatives in the House of Representatives is not a new thing, so drop the ageism. Young uh, voices from either spectrum of the political uh, spectrum, uh, not too far right, please, and not too far left, but is needed. Like we, we need to hear those opinions. We need their insight because uh, I, I doubt that until Bernie ran for president, he knew what Twitter was. <laughs> and <laughs> I think. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have a, um, uh, a a couple of comments from a chat. If you don't mind uh, interacting okay. a bit uh, with our live oh. audience, oh, definitely, I don't mind at all. Okay, so uh, David Martin asks, uh, "What does Chris have to do uh, with the entertainment industry?" <laughs> definitely. Hey, David. Um, so I actually work work at Hulu. So I actually I'm actually a recruiter here within the pro, uh, technical program management space. Uh, prior to joining Hulu, I actually worked at the Walt Disney Company, where I supported uh, ESPN and Disney ABC Television Group. Um, I was a recruiter there, so I got to I got a chance to check out the uh, ESPN downtown facilities a lot and spend a lot of time on the studio. So that's about as far as my entertainment background goes. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, we have a more of a comment uh, that I would like your response to from sure. Rochelle L. Uh, she commented on uh, on your young age uh, and the ageism you've met uh, by saying it's not wait your turn. It's more like, hey, we need more time to corrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, de I definitely think that when you look at the politics of uh, the traditional path within getting uh, into office, it's say hey, you start interning at 22, uh, you go work for maybe someone in the you know the assembly or so, someone in the state legislator, or maybe you're lucky enough to get a job uh, working for someone in the house. So you gain all of their all of their connections. You learn about some of the uh, some of the interesting ways that they do things, and then they say, okay, we see you as a party loyalist. So here's all the revenue. 
boom, all right, this person's going to retire because they want to go get a higher office, and then you can go in and take over their position. By then, you're really kind of you're drinking all of their Kool-Aid, you're using all of their talking points, and you're taking money from their donors, and you're already within the system. You know, luckily enough for myself, or I mean, uh, part of my entry into politics was obviously interning in a Republican's office, so I saw the ways not to do things. And then when I went, came here and you know went, started working with the uh, Los Angeles County Democratic Party, you know, I heard a lot of views that were ninth, from like the 1930s or so, uh, and I used to call them a uh, conservative. Uh, I called them conservative liberals. So uh, yeah, so it's they're definitely they're definitely trying to get you in a situation where they can mold you into saying exactly what they want. And you know, I've gotten a lot of pushback from some Democratic officials, including those within the West LA Democratic Club that I was a chair member of, asking me, "Hey, why are why are you running?" So. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Okay, so I have a final question, and then sure. we have to wrap up and move okay. on to the last part of our show. Uh, okay. Chris, um, right now there is, amongst the Bernie Sanders supporters, a huge uh, schism between uh, getting in line behind Hillary, or at least getting in line behind uh, the progressive Democrats, and mm -hmm. uh, saying, no, uh, choosing lesser evil is still choosing evil. We will go with the Green Party, please. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, I work with uh, a lot of uh, people who has a, a view on the Democratic Party's history, especially on minorities. So my question mm -hmm. to you is, as both your uh, personal history but also politically, why is the Democratic Party? Why not the Green Party? Definitely, yeah. Um, I'd say that the biggest thing is, I look at I look at continuity. Like I, got, I got in this race as a Democrat. I came back to Los Angeles as a Democrat, uh, so a lot of that does kind of guide it. And I think from a like actually running a campaign standpoint, just changing it could be problematic. Just changing or problematic to some of the voters uh, when changing party, like from going from primary uh, and going to the general election. Uh, so that's so that's one reason. Then when I look at as far as to address the area. Uh, kind of the history of the Democratic Party, and uh, I think you mentioned as it relates to minorities, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, you look at it, right? It's this is a this is a party that was largely uh, built in with Southern Democrats, and you know, there's a lot of people that were within the KKK within the party, right? Um, that's a that's obviously a shameful history. And then right around the New Deal, that's when things started to shift and alter and all. So I look at the Democratic Party as they. I think that they got it wrong. Well, the vote, you know, those who voted in uh, the DNC, well, no, not those who voted in, right? Because we know that the DNC went and got Hillary there. So those in the DNC, I think that they got it wrong. And you know, unfortunately, we're at one of those times where the Democratic Party has sort of lost its way. Uh, so the reason, so my reason is not necessarily, hey, no to the Green Party, but it's a yes to the Democratic Party in the sense that yes, I'm going to change the Democratic Party and get us back uh, back where we're supposed to be, all right, back where we're the honest party, where we don't have to resort to corruption, where we don't have to, re you know, we're not, where we're not supporting uh, Citizens United, right? So that, so it's not a, it's not, it's not that I'm anti-Green Party, that I don't want to join the Green Party, it's that, hey, you know, the Democratic Party, they, they need someone who's going to be on the inside to fight it and change, and change everything. You know, if Jill Stein were to win the election here, uh, let her know that, hey, you know, you know, part you know, party aside, I have her, I have her back, and I'm going to make sure that we get, uh, we're going to get legislation that works. And then, you know, that would be even to be the same thing uh, if Donald Trump were. Well, I'd hope that Donald Trump's not elected, but I let him know, hey, you know, it's uh, I'm I'm old, I'm old school Democrat, all right, and I'm a true progressive, and those are the type of le that's the type of legislation you're going to see from me. So uh, whether you know, I don't know who I guess Martin O'Malley might be the person that they're looking to fill the fill the DNC chair position. I'd let I'd let him know as well that hey. You stay, you know, stay true to true progressiveness, all right? And you have an ally. If not, I'm going to keep fight. I'm going to keep fighting the inside, and I'm not going to play your little game. So, okay. Well, everyone, that was Chris Wiggins, U.S. House candidate for California District 37. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Chris Thank Wiggins. You. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right, you guys have a great day. You too. So uh, just to uh, sound off of something that uh, Chris mentioned, having uh, Jill Stein's back while still being a Democrat. The Founding Fathers uh, designed this system around having uh, political individuals join the Senate, the House, and uh, the, establ the uh, establishment in D.C. and in the local state houses. That was the idea, local individuals that had each other's back on uh, across political ideologies. Uh, John Adams and among others were starch opponents of political parties ever coming into existence.